Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's installment of the Huron Pines Connecting to Nature series. We're excited to spend the next 30 minutes learning with you. At Huron Pines, we work to conserve and enhance Northern Michigan's natural resources. Focused in three primary program areas, healthy water, protected places, and vibrant communities, our staff implement projects from river restoration and green infrastructure to protecting special places forever and controlling invasive species populations. If you're not familiar with our work, we encourage you to get to know us. I'm Emily Vogelsang, Huron Pines Environmental Education Coordinator. Jen Clem, a Huron Pines AmeriCorps member serving at Huron Pines, will be leading a great conversation today. Before we dive into that, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. One, please make sure to use the chat box to respond to questions. You'll see them bolded on the slides. Or ask questions of your own today. Everyone will remain muted for the rest of this program. If you experience any technical difficulties, Chris Engel, our communications associate, is available on the chat by email or phone. We will also be recording this installment, so if you lose connection, you can watch later. And finally, your video was turned off when you entered. Please know that if you turn it back on, all participants can see you. And finally, I want to acknowledge our incredible funders who support the Huron Pines Education Program. The Great Lakes Fishery Trust, Consumers Energy Foundation, the U.S. Forest Service, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities through the Healthy Watersheds Consortium Project, and individual donors and supporters like you. And with that, I'm gonna let Jen introduce herself and then we'll dive into this week's topic. Hey everyone, um, and thank you, Emily, for such a lovely introduction again. Um, like Emily said, I'm Jen Clem. I'm an AmeriCorps service member with Huron Pines, serving as part of my VISTA um, time at Michigan Tech, where I'm pursuing my master's in applied ecology. And um, I've also worked as a landscaper for several seasons up in the UP, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys about plants and gardens. Um, so we're going to be covering native plants today. So we're going to do kind of a brief overview into what that means, um, some of the pollinators we'd be expecting to see, some things to consider when going native with your gardens, um, so a couple of examples of garden design, and then how you can apply it to your own life. So it should be really exciting. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, Jen. Um, so why don't we start off with sort of putting some definitions around that native plant phrase and how we're gonna be using that today. Right, so when we think of native plants, every plant is native somewhere, right? Like um, purple loosestrife is native to a particular eco ecosystem, just not here. So when we say native right now, we're talking about native to Michigan and the Midwest in general. So plants that were here pre-European settlement that weren't really brought over, that weren't, um, that weren't new. They were well established within the communities here and well established for our climates, our soils, our ecosystems. Um, so kind of thinking about that, what do you guys, do you have any favorite native plants already going into this? Um, feel free to just throw that in the chat as we kind of open up and warm up here. So. One of my favorite native plants uh, is a is a cardinal flower. I just love love seeing it along the riverbanks when I'm when I'm paddling in the summer and that vibrant red that you don't always see out in, in the wild. Mm -hmm. Well, and they have such unique flower shapes too, like almost like orchids with that kind of like asymmetry. Yeah, and Sharon is sharing that cardinal flower is also <laughs> one of her favorites. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I personally love purple cone flowers, echinacea, because you can make such a wonderful tea out of them for when you have colds, and it's, it's amazing. Very cool. And we're hearing trillium, uh, monadra and liatris, uh, columbine, mm -hmm. um, all things that I Perfect. think we were chatting about as we were prepping for this. Right, yeah, because they're all gorgeous and they're all wonderful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So kind of we're thinking about which ones we love, we're thinking about they're native to here, right? But what do they do? Like, why are they so important? Mm -hmm. And part of the big thing, especially in times of climate change, like right now, um, they're pretty climate resilient because they have lived here, they have grown up here, they know, um, especially Michigan natives, right? They, they know those harsh winters, they know those harsh summers, um, they know our Kalkaska sand, our state's soil is a sand, right? Like, 
this is, um, it's just crazy. And so in going along with that, they help protect the water quality and they help maintain soil health because they have, you know, these beautiful root structures that are specifically designed to capture water and hold water in our soils and help prevent erosion, right? Because that's what they've been doing for hundreds of years, right? Yeah. Holding it um, down through all those crazy lake winds. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they also kind of support the native fauna that have also been around for hundreds of years, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that some naturalized plants aren't important, which they definitely are, but natives are especially important to keep vibrant and um, healthy and in our gardens. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. cool. so is there anything else that you guys, any reasons that you think native plants are important? Like they look really pretty or they... <laughs> um, <laughs> or anything else like that? I personally think a lot about native plants in terms of um, some of our native trees and the wonderful mm. shade that they provide. I'm a big fan of a, of a, of a nice shade tree. <laughs> <laughs> right, and they, and they usually are pretty resistant to funguses and diseases too around. Um, yeah, and today we won't be talking quite as much about trees. We'll probably be focusing more on herbaceous plants, but if you guys in the chat want to talk more about trees too, like feel free. They are <laughs> awesome, and I wish that we had more time. <laughs> yes, awesome. All right, so what are some of those examples of, of those native wildlife? Yeah, so we have a lot of things that you might not think about. Um, of course, we have bees, so we have this beautiful picture of a bee on a purple cone flower in the bottom right. Um, but then, you know, monarchs, right, and milkweed, that, that wonderful relationship that they have together um, are ones that you might be thinking about, but maybe you don't think about hummingbirds as being pollinators, mm -hmm. as helping disperse those. And so we have a beautiful cardinal flower and a beautiful hummingbird. Um, and I believe ruby-throated hummingbirds use our range for breeding, um, if I'm correct on that. And then also little guys that you might not think about are bats. They're great pollinators. They love sweet things like fruits and nectars and all that. And then they're gathering insects that have pollen on them and then they transport that between flowers. So they're wonderful little pollinators that you can try and attract to your house too. Yeah, lots of, lots of incredible things. We're hearing from other folks um, supporting wildlife and those native butterflies and pollinators um, and bird habitat. So lots of great reasons to be thinking uh, about native plants. So, so what are the things that we have to think about when we're thinking about using native plants in gardening or, or on our property? Um, yeah, so we kind of have to think about some of those upfront considerations um, in addition to all the other things that we'll talk about. But so with native plants, they're not always going to look beautiful right away. Um, we don't have quite the extensive selection of growers. Like if you go to your local greenhouse, right, those were being often being grown somewhere else and shipped in, or some of the local greenhouses will grow beautiful ornamentals. But for native plants, we usually don't have those options. So you're, instead of getting the big gallons or quart containers, you're often getting like just the little, the little baby startups. So a lot of times when you look into planting native um, plants in your garden, it's gonna take about two to three years for them to start really getting established and start really looking full and beautiful. So it might look a little sparse up until then, but over time, right, it's going to end up being less right. maintenance overall. Right. Um, so you might have to pay a little bit more because, again, we don't have the cost brought down because the supply is lower. Um, but with time, hopefully, things will change and we'll have more available options. But it, when you're looking at long-term ease of care, if you want a garden that's going to be low maintenance, that so you don't have to water as much, you don't have to weed as much, native plants are a really, really good option for that. Cool. Yeah, I think we can all agree that the less weeding that we have to do, the better. <laughs> right, yeah, and um, anything to keep some of those invasives out of gardens too, yeah. like uh, Barbary and um, some of the other ones, so yeah. And also things that you might not normally consider um, are root sizes, right? So roots are not one size fits all for a plant. So right on screen now we have um, some examples of different prairie plants and their root systems. And so when we think about roots, we have kind of two main types of roots. We have tap roots, which extend really deep into the earth. Um, they're really good for if you have lower water tables or if water can be kind of sparse. Um, so trees often have tap roots, right? 
whereas grasses often have fibrous roots, they, they tend to stick more towards the top surface layer and then get whatever water comes. And so those are really, really good in sandy prairie settings because they help keep the soil intact. Um, but when we're thinking about our gardens, right, we, we want to make sure that the plants not only have a beautiful variety up top, but that we also have a beautiful variety in our roots so that they're not over competing. Like if you, you put too many grasses in and they'll start just like stealing <laughs> all of the nutrients, right, and outcompete all the other ones below ground, um, even if above ground everything's looking fine. So, um, yeah, and so kind of just a closer look at that and some of the variety, like we look at the purple cone flowers on the right and how relatively small their root system is compared to that blazing star, right, which is going what looks like 14 feet <laughs> below ground, like just an insane, insane root system. And then when you start to think like from our talk last week about mycorrhizal fungal connections and those those fungi that are extending underneath and going between all of these plants and weaving their way. It's, um, it's really beautiful underground. Yeah. Work. Yeah. I love, um, Midwest and Plain State native plants are just incredible with those root systems and have so much more going on underground than most of us think about until we, we see these great examples. Um, so when we think we're thinking about roots and we're thinking about wanting to have, have those beautiful colors or whatever up top, how, how do we even begin to, to narrow it down from the wide selection of native plants? Right, so um, we, we have to think about a few other factors too, like what your soils are like. So most of us probably live with those sandy soils, right, um, which are the bane of gardeners everywhere because they just, they drain water like no other. Um, but you can actually find out what your soils are like pretty simply. So in the take home notes that Chris is going to be sending out. So if you want to get those, just shoot him your email. Um, we have an at home soil test, which is just a mason jar, some dirt and some water and you shake it up. And it's, it's really easy to know what percentage of sand versus clay versus silt you have. And then you can consult the soil table because loam is ideal for gardening. But um, if you're planting with natives, right, you can fudge that a little bit and you can have it be a little bit more sandy. Um, you also have to think about how much water the area is going to get consistently. Like, do you want to pay to have a sprinkler system set up for it or do you want to just kind of let it be natural? Again, the bonus of having native plants is they know how to thrive on <laughs> little water um, or at least the weird seasonal water that we get here. So like the, <laughs> the snow melt in the spring and then our weird August rains and September rains that just come out of nowhere and then the cold. And then also think about like how much sun or shade is at your garden because plants can get sunburned too and some are more sensitive than others about that. So, and that's a really easy, again, at home test. You can just, when you wake up, you look at where you want to have your garden, you see how much sun there is at lunchtime, you check and see if there's sun and then at night you check and see if there's sun, right? And then as long as you have a over six hours of sun per day. You can plant full sun plants. If it's kind of on the fence, maybe go for partial shade. And if it's pretty much no sun, go for really shade tolerant plants. So, Gotcha. So that afternoon, early evening timing is, mm -hmm. is a key piece to pay attention to. Right, yeah, because you, the hottest parts of the, uh, the hottest rays of the sun are also going to be very hot for plants and it's um, a good time for them to lose water and start transpiring. So um, even if you don't get a lot of sun during the day, if you do have a west facing area or you have something that's really getting hit by that afternoon sun, I would generally say to focus more on um, full sun plants as opposed mm -hmm. to part shade because even if it's only two hours in the afternoon well if it's only two hours probably go part shade but like <laughs> you know if it's if it's only four hours but it's during the hottest part of the day treat it like you would you know um, a person right okay cool so what are some what are some examples what are we thinking about when we think about our native plants to select from yeah, so we have tons and tons of options, especially if you love that purple yellow color scheme, which are those beautiful contrasting colors, right? So kind of going clockwise, clockwise from the top left, um, looking at these ones are all good for sunny areas. Um, we have Coreopsis, which is beautiful yellow, be lovely sprays. 
We have Blazing Star, which are purple. They're tall spikes. They're, they're absolutely stunning in late summer, fall, I believe. Um, goldenrod, which goldenrod actually doesn't cause allergies, like everyone thinks. It's, that's ragweed, and ragweed is horrible, and it, it grows underneath, and it's, it's the bane of existence. But <laughs> goldenrod is generally good unless you're specifically allergic to it. Um, like I said, purple cone flowers, wonderful, um, great medicinal plants too, and also just really, really beautiful. Um, we have asters. Those white ones are actually asters. So they come in all sorts of colors and like pinks and purples and whites. So they're a really great addition if you want that variety. Um, we have black eyed Susans. And I think, Emily, you have a fun fact about black eyed Susans. Yeah, so one uh, thing I learned about black eyed Susans, so most of our Michigan natives, so, so ones that have really um, developed to be in, in Michigan, um, we can identify them with the fuzzy stem, um, whereas some of our more general Midwestern uh, varieties of black eyed Susans are going to have a smoother stem. So it's not always exact, but it is a good way to know if you're encountering one that's closer to a Michigan native than just a broadly Midwestern native. That's a really cool fact. I like yeah. that. <laughs> um, yeah, and so continuing on, we have in the bottom right hand corner that beautiful orange is butterfly or um, is butterfly weed, which is kind of like a cousin to that our pink and purple milkweed. Um, bee balm is next and it's it's really fun and really showy in a lot of ways and attracts those beautiful pollinators. Um, we have evening primrose which almost looks very lily-like kind of um, as an alternate to Asiatic lilies maybe. Um, the grass which is, I'm sorry the picture is a little bit blurry but it's um, big blue stem so a beautiful showy native grass so if you're looking for that kind of pinkish purpley grass color it's it's a great option. And then we have milkweed. So if you want to have a beautiful garden full of monarchs and help support their habitat and their community, that is like always a wonderful choice. So if you don't have full sun though, and you're looking at partial shade, we, there are still lots of beautiful options. Um, so again, going top left and then going clockwise, we have coral bells, which are some of my favorite ones. We, we planted them a lot in landscaping and I love them. They have their beautiful tall flower spikes, but then usually, the leaves themselves form a, a nice mound and are really good for like lining a path or anything like that. Um, our native wild columbine is a beautiful choice too. It has the red and yellow petaled flowers and they, again, they form a nice little mound and they have um, really pretty delicate leaves as well. And then next we have the wild geranium. So again, kind of a low ground cover plant, but that makes sense, right? Partial shade. Um, and those really cute purple delicate flowers. Then we have blue flag iris, which if you're looking for an alternate to maybe the standard iris and you wanna go with something that's native, these are really beautiful, really delicate. Um, not quite as big maybe in the flower as some of the ornamental irises, mm -hmm. but a little bit better for native pollinators because sometimes all of that flower can get in the way and they can get lost and confused and scared. Um, <laughs> Uh, next on the bottom, we have silverweed, which is a little bit rarer to find, but it makes for a really, really nice ground cover, especially with those bright yellow flowers, um, just kind of help pop out an area. Uh, next is Joe Pieweed, which has, again, really nice, pretty pink flowers. A uh, cup plant, which is a cousin to sunflowers. So <laughs> if you want to do sunflowers or have that kind of tall yellow um, plant garden, uh, that's a good option. And then nodding wild rye if you want, again, another beautiful native decorative grass. Cool. Um, good option. And then for full shade, there are several options, but ferns are always pretty much a good bet. So on the left, we have ostrich ferns, which are big, beautiful, showy ferns. And then on the right, if you're looking for more of a little delicate fern, lady fern is always a good choice. Um, and then if you're looking for a ground cover for an area and you want it to have a little bit of color, a little bit of pop, wintergreen is actually an amazing choice. And there's so much that you can do with wintergreen because it's edible, right? The leaves are edible, the berries are edible. It has those beautiful bright red berries um, and it, it spreads really well. So those are a few of our native options. Sweet. So what do they look like when we, or what can they look like once we throw them into a garden design? Right, so these, um, these examples are using ornamentals, but right, if you're thinking about it, and you're thinking about colors and you're thinking about contrast, 
you can use natives in any standard traditional garden setup. So if you want to do that English cottage garden, a lot of times that's, you know, the ideal is to use kind of these native plants, right? These bigger, um, these bigger showier plants or that form these beautiful mounds, but we have great diversity, right? So you could have some of the coral bells lining the pathway. You could have some of those big blazing stars. You could um, include some of the, uh, the cup plants, you could include evening primrose, right? And just kind of create this beautiful, seemingly random pathway of color <laughs> and have it go all year round, right? right. Um, if you wanna do the prairie garden, that one's a little bit easier because you just throw in some echinaceas, you throw in some black eyed Susans, you're done, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> just plant them <laughs> as you would because it's, it's like you wanna take it, make it look like you just took a little slice of prairie and put it in your own backyard, right? So when you're doing this kind of design, it's anything goes really, um, just to keep that beautiful color, that vibrancy and make it look lush. Um, and then you don't have to worry about weeding, you don't have to worry about all that, because usually they can pretty much take care of themselves for the most part. However, if you do like that kind of more formal look, like I tend to prefer a little bit more structure in a garden, a Japanese garden style or a Chinese garden style might even be a really good option because even in this picture you can see they have some ferns which might be a really nice time to use those ostrich ferns or lady ferns and then each plant is essentially kind of put on display mm -hmm. so um, you can have a, a mounded section of columbine and then across the way you can have those purple cone flowers and then you can have some milkweed right um, while still highlighting all the individual beauty you you can have it look a little less wild too right so so you've referenced a couple times having this beauty year round how do we think about that year round or at least growing season round kind of beauty right yeah and so um you can look at each individual plants um bloom times and calculate that out but that is kind of a headache and a little <laughs> bit frustrating and so msu actually has a really good guide and i'm sure there are other good guides online but msu is specifically for our native plants here in michigan um and so they actually have this beautiful bloom chart so that you can keep color and vibrancy in your garden all the way from may until october which seems kind of crazy <laughs> up here because we're starting to get snow in October and we're only just barely getting out of winter in May. But um, yeah, so you can think about incorporating these and they have the pictures. And so you can think about if you want your spring seasons to be all yellow flowers and you want your summers to be all purple flowers and you want your fall to be white, you know, um, you can really mix it up and you can really play with it. And so things like this is a really good, um, a, a really good sample to have yeah. to, when you're thinking about what to add to your garden. And even maybe you have an existing garden and you just want to add some more native plants to it, you can think, hmm, well, I don't really have much blooming in July. And so you could go and be like, oh, well, maybe some Coreopsis. And you can start slow and, and add to what you already have, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so kind of thinking about that, how we can apply it, right? You don't You don't have to go out and dig up a whole new garden. You don't have to like add all of these native plants at once, you can, you can make some, a few swaps. So maybe instead of buying a ton of annuals this year, you start with maybe some native perennials. And so then you, it's easier on your budget overall and, um, and it helps you kind of bring those native plant pollinators in. Yeah. Um, even just thinking when you do go to buy maybe um, ornamental varieties and greenhouses, and you're thinking about pollinator friendly swaps, um, don't go for the double blooms, right? The ones right. that have those big showy beautiful flowers are awesome, but that also means that they have less food for pollinators. So um, just maybe some of those switches or like, for example, we have sugar maples instead of Norway maples if you're looking for trees to plant yeah. because then you can tap them in the spring and you don't have to worry about tar spot disease, which is also how you can tell a Norway maple and a sugar <laughs> maple really easily. Okay. So, yeah, so if anyone's getting any ideas for what they're going to plan this year or plant, uh, feel free to throw that in the chat. But, and then that kind of brings us to an activity for this week. So plan your own native garden. Even if you can't necessarily go out and dig it up or you don't have the time or space, I know I'm in an apartment right now, so it, it's a little <laughs> bit harder. 
but um, what would it look like? What would you want to include? Were there any pictures um, that we showed, like the columbines, and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to have columbines everywhere, or <laughs> what insects or um, other pollinators would you want to attract? Would you want a bat-friendly garden? Would you want that? So just thinking about that, um, I know I did earlier as an example, and I just and we'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah. So I have a key of which plants I would put in there. I have kind of the beds. I have my apartment. Um, and just thinking about what colors I want, what, what sort of repetition I would want, which is kind of when you have like purple here, yellow, purple, yellow, to just kind of add that visual interest. So. Cool. Thanks for that activity, Jen. I'm excited to pull out my notebook after we hop off and... Uh dream about when I've got space for, for a garden one day. <laughs> uh, we're hearing some folks that say that they're now thinking about native grasses and sedges, um, looking at planting some milkweed seeds. Um, so thanks for the content. Um, if you're looking for ways to get outside, uh, check out the Stay Connected to Nature page at HuronPines.org. Um, that wraps up today's content. We really appreciate everyone joining. I have just a few wrap up items and then we have time for questions. Uh, as part of our efforts to understand how we can continue to improve programming like this, we'd appreciate a couple minutes of your time to fill out an evaluation survey. Chris is gonna put that link into the chat box. We do have an overview document like Jen has been referencing um, that is gonna cover, uh, recap what she covered today as well as provide some of those additional resources. If you pre-registered with Chris, you will get that automatically. If you didn't, uh, please email Chris. He's at chris at huronpines.org, and he'll make sure to get you that information. And be sure to join us every Thursday the rest of this month at 1 p.m. Next week, we're covering Unwind Outside, where we'll explore nature journaling and hiking and how that can benefit your personal health as well as natural resource health. Okay, Jen, I've got questions coming in, um, and I'm gonna cover the first one real quick. For those of you asking where to get plants, um, you've seen in the chat box, a lot of your conservation districts are going to grow them, um, in particular here in Northern Michigan, the Otsego Conservation District has a, a fully native uh, greenhouse. Um, several downstate nurseries, um, including wild type, uh, can get those to you. Um, someone has included that uh, Bird's Foot Native nursery, nursery in South Boardman has them. Uh, we can get you those contacts. And then also on here on Pines website, we have a couple other uh, specific locations referenced. Um, and so Jen, we have a question about uh, deer eating our native plants. Any thoughts on that one? So I think a lot of it comes down to which plants you're actually planting and how deer friendly they are. But kind of like we talked about last week with plants and stress, um, a lot of our native plants do have some responses to help keep them from being browsed by deer, which are a native um, predator to them. Kind of weird to think about <laughs> herbivores as predators, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I think a lot of them tend to be more resistant to being browsed. Um, they're not necessarily quite as tasty. They're not necessarily the first choices for things like deer. Um, I think it, it also depends. I know they tend to avoid smellier things. So if you're choosing um, plants that have those options or have a little bit more spikiness to them, like purple cone flowers tend to be a little bit more spiky to the touch and I think would Okay. Um, be less likely to be browsed. Okay, cool. So um, yeah. we have some milkweed seeds that they're looking to plant. Uh, does it make sense to sow these seeds now or wait until fall? Um, I am not as familiar with milkweed specifically if it needs a cold hardening off period. Mm -hmm. I think if you have enough of them, you could try it and see how it starts in the spring. Um, online, I'm sure MSU has resources or anything for that specifically, um, but I, I don't think that it'd hurt to start them, or you could even start them indoors if you have uh, those options and then take them outside once we're past the first frost if they don't need the hardening off. Um, but I, I What do you mean double by that? Uh, will you explain that hardening off real quick and what you mean by oh. that for what the process our native yeah. plants often undergo? 
Right, yeah. So um, hardening off is kind of like this, this period where seeds need to go through this chilled dormancy. So things like poppies, when you sow them, you tend to sow them in the fall so that they can go through this chilling time. Um, bulbs also do that, right, which is why they come up in the spring. So if you wanted to have tulips in your own home or something, you would have to basically freeze them or cool them or chill them for a, a period of time before they would actually start sprouting. Okay. Um, so cool. um, I don't know. I feel like milkweed seems to be prolific enough. You might be okay <laughs> yeah. with doing it. And we should probably still be getting snow here any day. So. Okay, cool. So um, I do want to honor our 30 minute time slot. It is 1.30. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, Jen and I can stay on for another 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I do see all these other wonderful questions coming in. So we'll talk through those. Um, Jen is displaying um, some additional uh, videos that can provide some information for you. Um, again, all of this will be included if you reach out to Chris and he'll get you um, the resource page. Um, but otherwise, if, if you're done, we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, Jen, you ready for some more questions coming in? Yeah, let's All go. Right. Um, what do you suggest we plant in or near vegetable gardens to attract those beneficial insects and deter those non-beneficial <laughs> insects? Any of our native plants that could hit on that uh, pollination balance with any uh, deterrence properties? Um, so there is in that MSU um, guide that has the bloom times, they do have a wild onion. Um, I think I threw it in mine. So a lot of times wild onions um, have the, the big beautiful flower heads, so those alliums, and they also tend to deter bugs. And there are, it's really hard to find companion planting things for native plants. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of ones that if you plant like garlic or um, onion in a soil, it'll, it'll spread. Like the flavor of it will spread to other plants, um, kind of that helping relationship piece. And so that can help deter some of the bugs and predators. Um, I think if you're also wanting to do a vegetable garden and have pollinators, choosing things like, um, like echinacea or other ones that have kind of these wonderful medicinal properties that you can make teas from are always a good choice because then you have the beauty of the pollination and then you can also use them for various other uses. Cool. Um, but yeah, I would see onions, I think are always a good one. So alliums are always a nice choice for okay. keeping those at bay. And then um, if there's a specific insect you want to target, I would, I would double check or you can send me an email and I can, um, look that up and dig more into that for you too. But I think it's general rule of thumb, uh, garlic and onions. Cool, that's a great tip. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is a tough one, Sharon. What mm -hmm. natives are good to plant over a septic field? So I guess we're thinking yeah. any of our natives that have shallower roots maybe? Right, yeah. Um, it can be tricky if you, grasses tend to have very aggressive root systems. Mm -hmm. Um, so choosing things that have those really soft fibrous roots, so even thinking back to kind of that prairie slide, looking at ones that don't go too, too deep, um, but also have, but also probably ones that you don't want to be using medicinally, so maybe you could probably do purple cone flowers because they don't have as deep of tap roots or as thick of a root system, um, even though they do have that tap root, it's not, it's not the most aggressive by any means. Okay. Um, but you probably wouldn't want to be using it for tea <laughs> just, just because plants take up what they absorb. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would, um, definitely check what root systems, um, probably more ephemeral type plants that, that don't necessarily have really hardy, aggressive growth, but just tend to stick more to smaller sizes would be a good guess, I'd say. Okay. Um, we've got a question about the mason jar test that Jen mentioned. Um, be yeah. sure to reach out to uh, Chris and we have those instructions included. It's a quick pick up some soil, shake it up, let it settle, yeah. and then we have the guide that will point you towards based on how much of uh, each of our soil, soil type particles um, mm -hmm. you have, then you can sort of know where your soil stands. Yep, and, um, and that works because um, 
like the sand has a lot larger particles compared to silt or clay and so sand will settle out first and create a nice layer on the bottom. Silt will settle out on top of it and you can actually see that layer visible and then clay will settle on top of that. So, and then you can just um, add those up and then you get your percentage of sand, silt, and clay for that particular area. So very, very easy at home test. And then if you're also interested in like pH or some of those other tests, um, there's great tests you can do with cabbage. So boiling cabbage and um, some other things. So if you want to reach out and have any of those questions, I'd be happy to help get you some of those resources too. Cool. Um, I think we just have one more question and it's at Native Plant Exchange Days in Northern Michigan. Um, and we do have some of those throughout Northern Michigan. Uh, typically they're gonna be hosted via your conservation districts or some of our local garden clubs are facilitating that kind of thing. Um, it's also really helpful to think about any of your neighbors um, or friends that are already doing native gardening and going to steal some of their seeds from them in the fall um, and, and getting them ready. Um, so if you, a lot of our native plants are, you're gonna be fine to, to snip off the seed heads and, and steal some of those seeds to get going in your own location if you can't get to any of our uh, native plant sources in Michigan. And the benefit too going on that um, is that you don't have to necessarily worry about them being sterile, right? And so that you actually can plant the seeds and reuse them. So. Cool. Awesome. Already, um, I'll put the last offer up that Jen and I will hang out for a couple minutes in case any other questions come up. Uh, but we really do appreciate you joining us and hope to see a lot of you next Thursday at 1 p.m. for Unwind Outside. I don't know. I'm really excited to pick up some native plants this year and throw them in my backyard. Maybe not like a full native garden, but <laughs> definitely, definitely some. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's always nice to walk past on my current walks. Um, we do have a question about the presentation being available. Yes. Um, so what is going to happen with all of these is that the recording is being posted um, on Huron Pines um, YouTube page and on our social media pages. Um, and then most of the content that was here will be provided in that additional um, resource page. The recordings are also going on our website. Um, so it's out there. If there's anything specific, um, so we had somebody ask about that list of plants that Jen was running, running through. Um, we will pull that out so that you guys can have that. Um, and so all the material is available. And again, just reach out if there's anything specific. Um, we aren't a landscaping company, so we're not gonna design your garden for you, but we are certainly um, happy to point you towards resources and answer any questions. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the pH test, Jen, while we've got Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and I just also kind of want to plug, I, I really like this book, Garden Alchemy by Stephanie Rose. And so it has a lot of kind of the things like the mason jar test was one of the ones that I've known because I took a soils class at Tech and all these other things. But the cabbage water pH test is really cool because um, cabbage has this wonderful chemical in it. Um, and so what you do is you boil some distilled water with cabbage and then let it simmer for 10 minutes and let it cool and then pour it in a jar with the soil that you want to test. And then based on what color it turns is the pH of your soil. So um, if it turns, I think if it turns pink or red, it, the soil is acidic. If it turns kind of greenish yellow, it's alkaline. And if it's bluish purple, it's neutral. So that's a really fun visual way, especially if you want to engage kiddos or anyone. I mean, even I think that that's super cool and I want to <laughs> test it. Yeah. <laughs> but um so that's just a quick and easy way. You can also use vinegar and baking soda and um, combine those with soil and based on the reaction. Um, if it fizzes, I think it's more acidic. Yeah, or if it fizzes, the soil is alkaline. If it doesn't, then it's more acidic. So um, there are some of those fun tests too, but definitely cabbage water is super easy. You just boil some cabbage, put it in a jar with some soil, and then look at the color. So. <laughs> That's cool. And then uh, just for everyone that's still on, you can also, um, I can't speak to the capacity right now, um, but in once things settle back out, MSU Extension does 
um, provide uh, soil testing. Uh, so essentially what you would do is you get a kit from your local extension office and you dig up some of your soil, uh, mail it down to East Lansing. They run a gamut of tests on it and then you get um, sort of just a great one pager back on any um, amendment recommendations or that sort of thing. Um, so that's a resource, again, available through some of our public agencies. Um, that's, that's a pretty easy thing. Um, but again, right now you're probably better off on some of the cabbage tests and some of the mason jar tests, um, just as everyone's capacity looks a little bit different. For landscaping, used to use MSU Extension for testing um, client soil, and she absolutely loved it. And it's such an easy process too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. definitely, we would use it at Grand Pines a lot for our restoration projects to understand how to make our plant selections or uh, if they're working in terms of, of uh, <laughs> doing some rehab on our soils. Cool. Cool. Alrighty, well, it looks like we don't have any other questions coming in. Um, so again, um, thanks for being here today. Uh, Chris, just threw the evaluation link in there. Again, we really appreciate any feedback that you can give us. Um, and be sure to reach out to Chris if you uh, would like that additional resources page. Thanks, everyone. Thank <laughs>